All right. Uh, so, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. And it looks like we have a nice crowd today. <laughs> Um, it must have been the food, I'm sure. Uh, so anyway, my name is Prashant Punjabi. I'm uh, I've been at Solution at Solution Street now for six years and change. Uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit was about about a few data structures and algorithms. It's going to be a, probably a quick presentation. It may be kind of repetitive. I mean, you know, not break breakthrough or groundbreaking for a lot of them, but you might, I mean, um, hopefully there'll be a few things that will be new to you, to each of you, or you will learn something anyway. So, so the reason I wanted to do this was, was basically like, it's, it's, as we've been, as we've all been developing web applications, whatever applications we're working on, for the most part, most problems that we, we, we solve, you know, the, the central thing that we need to first figure out is how do we organize the data, right? I mean, it could be in databases and in indexes and, and whatever. In some cases, if you kind of roll back, it also might be like, you know, when you're solving a particular problem, you might have to choose how you organize your data in, in a list or, a, or some other data structure. I think once you figure that out, usually the solution that comes that follows, you know, it, it follows pretty, Pretty smoothly after that, right? So, so that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about data structures. And I'll start right at the beginning of the data structure, right? The most easy data structure that we can think of. So that was the first one. I was not going to talk about arrays <laughs> because obviously, like you know, we all know arrays. Arrays are a collection of data, <laughs> a list of data where you know the the, the order is, is is important. But but before we had. <laughs> Before we had arrays, <laughs> before we had arrays, I guess uh, the first thing that that we learned, at least I learned, was a linked list, right? So what is a linked list? A linked list is a data structure that is basically a, a, a list made of made up of nodes. Each node has some data, and also it points to the next element in the list, right? So so that's that's how it works, and also, and also in some case in the start of the list, the head of the list will have a pointer so you know where it starts. Uh, there are different types of linked lists. The most common one, obviously, is a singly linked list, which is the one that we saw. The doubly linked list will, will be a list that basically a list, uh, the nodes point to, the, to what goes before and also to what after them, so you can traverse the list in both directions. A circular linked list is something that, you know, obviously, the last element of the list points to the first element, so you can go through the list in a circle. Uh, but why why do we need linked lists, right? I mean, when we have arrays, right? We, we use arrays all the time. They they seem fine. I did I did do a, a search on when you should use a linked list versus an array, and there there are really really detailed discussions about that on Quora and on Stack Overflow, which was fun to read through. But it basically boils down to this, right? Memory allocation. So when you look to think about arrays, arrays are static. Data structures. When you start, uh, you know, when you when you when you declare an array and you define an array, the memory for the array is usually has to be assigned, you know, in contiguous blocks of memory. Most of the time, programming languages tend to obscure this fact. Like, you know, for example, in Ruby, you can in, in, when you have a list, you grow it. But what happens is that behind the scenes, it is it has to find, you know, if it grows beyond a certain size, it it, it might have to then reallocate. The space somewhere else and copy stuff over if you know the contiguous blocks aren't available. With linked lists, they are more dynamic, right? So you, you they can grow as long as there's memory somewhere in the system, right? You can basically have they, you don't need to have contiguous blocks of memory. You can just you just need memory somewhere so you can allocate that space and then point to it, right? So that's basically the difference between an array on, or a linked list. So as, as I was talking about, in, in arrays, you know, you usually use an array if you want to find something quickly because you can just directly, you know, point to the, to the position that you want to go to. With linked list, you know, inserting stuff is easy because, especially if you're inserting it at the beginning of the list, right? So you could, all you need to do is just change the head pointer, make the head, like, for example, over here. If, if you were going to insert something to the, to the, to the start of this list, 
all you would do is make the new data point to the first node and then change the head to point to that, right? So you'd be inserting stuff to the list would be pretty pretty fast. Or adding to the list. Uh, so that's basically the difference between arrays and linked lists. Mm -hmm. What else? In terms of linear data structures, we have stacks, right? So stacks is 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 a last and first out data structure, where the last element on on this on the on the list will always be the first one out, right? Uh, so that's basically the only operation that is. Uh, so when so the operations on a stack are pretty easy, right? So you only all all you can do is you can push onto the stack or you can pop off it. If you think about the usages of something like a stack, it's it's basically like if you think about a, a, an editor, right? The undo redo operation. So all the operations of of an editor are basically stored. If you, if you think about it, they're stored on a stack, right? So whenever you hit undo. What you're doing is basically, you know, removing the last thing that you did, or basically reversing the last operation that you did. Same thing with browser history, right? The browser history, if you if you think about it, it's 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 basically like when you when you when you're trying to go back, you're basically removing the the, the most recent state of the stack of the stack that holds that holds the browser history, and then you go back one step. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have queues, right? So queues are, again, first in, first out. They're, the, the two operations on the queue are you, you, you end queue, and then you, you always end queue stuff to the, to the back of the queue, and when you remove stuff, it, it comes off the front of the queue, right? That's basically the two, only two operations that are possible on a queue. Some of the applications for a queue could be, if you think about it, like we've had, we've all might have worked with job schedulers, right? So when you have a job scheduler, what what that does is that it maintains a queue of process of of jobs to be run, and there may be multiple processes that are looking for the next job to be run in a central place. So in multi-threaded environments, that's how that could work. So whenever a worker needs a job to run, it basically asks the scheduler, "Give me what give the next job," and then that's where it takes the first element of the job queue and hands it over. Hands it over. The, another place where queues are used are in, in, in jQuery, for example. Like there is, whenever there's a uh, event processing, the J, whenever there's a series of functions that need to, uh, need to uh, execute asynchronously, the jQuery API has a DQ function, right? So all, these, all the operations are basically added to a queue and then, and then when it has to go through a bunch of asynchronous operations, it basically looks to the front of the queue to to start, you know, doing that. So, uh, excuse me. <laughs> so these, these, so so right now, so so far, what we've been talking about is basically a bunch of like linear data structures. So, but the thing about these structures is that they are. The order, or, the order is maintained, right? In, in, in stacks, queues, linked lists, arrays, all these structures so far, we're talking about the order is important. The, or, the order is, is significant, even if it, in stacks it may be last and first out in, in arrays. You know, you have the, the, you can access the elements in the order in which you've added to them. But also, but the, but the, but the downside for these structures, obviously, is like if you think about a list or an array, is that if you're looking for something in a list, uh, you have to traverse the whole whole list to find something, right? So till you till you find it. So looking up stuff in the, in the list might be slow, right? Which is why I mean, obviously, if we think about what we use very often, right? I mean, we, we use something called hash tables to to get around that. Hash tables are basically used whenever you want to to store something and you will you want to be able to look it up quickly in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a list. So you use something like a hash table. Uh, the hash table contains two parts. It's, it's basically an array, which is which is a bunch of space where you can where where you can store stuff, and it has a hash function. The hash function is used to map the data that is stored to to the position in the array where you want to store it, right? So you can retrieve values in constant time, regardless of how big the data structure is, right? So if you if you have a list of 
say thousand elements, you know, you might take you might have to go through a bunch of them till you find something in a, the hash table of thousand elements. The idea is that based on how good your hash function is and the way you've organized the data, you you should be able to find stuff in, in constant time. Uh, so this is an example of a hash table, for example. So here, here we have a, a, an array of the size of the array. The table size is 12. And what we're doing is we're storing books, book objects in the array. And the hash function that we've chosen is basically take the characters and the title and then divide it by modulo 12. So that's always going to return a number between 0 and, and 11. And then based on the based on that, that's where you based on the number that returns, you'll store the the book in that position, right? So that's something that that's one example of a hashing function or a hash algorithm. About hash functions. Uh, so the, the, the point of hash functions is that they should be easy to compute. The idea is that you should be able to quickly calculate the position in the array where you want to go get that element. Otherwise, I mean, you, you, if you have something that is computationally expensive, you, you would lose the point of actually having a hash table, right? Because you would rather than if something's going to, to calculate position, if it's going to take you enough, as much time as even just traversing the array, then you might as well just go traverse the array and get the element out of it. It has to be deterministic, obviously, like, so if you have the value, like, the function has to generate the same key for each value every time. For example, here, the great Gatsby has 14 characters, 14 modules, 12 is always two, right? It, if you had a hash function that, that, that's something that took the time of the day into account, then based on the time of the day that, you know, that you ran the, the function, you're going to get a different value. So that's kind of useless, right? Because then, if you were looking for the book, the Great Gatsby, you wouldn't you wouldn't know where it'll be a better find unless you knew what time you you, you did that. And the other thing is it, the hash function should avoid collisions, right? And what is a collision? A collision is when you have two values that map to the same position. Again, if you go back to this example, I mean this is obviously not a very great it's 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 just an illustrative example of a hash function. But you know, for example, if you had a bunch of books titles which were all 14 characters, right? They would all map to the position two, right? So so then you'd have to figure out a way to resolve those collisions, which we'll we'll talk about quickly. But the idea is that based on the size that you that you that you allocate initially, you would want to to have a hash function that distributes the values more or less evenly throughout that whole list, right? So mm -hmm. so, so in terms of resolving collisions, there are a couple strategies. The one strategy is linear probing, which is basically you go to the next, you basically go to the next element, next, uh, you start with the, with the position that the, that the hash function gives you, and then you go to the next position, you find the next empty slot, and if you, once you find it, that's where you place your object. Uh, or you can use chaining, which is basically each space in the array is a linked list, right? So the idea is that if you go here, if you had a bunch of uh, book titles with the 14 characters at position two, you'd have basically a list instead of a single object stored over there, right? So to be able to re retrieve something, the hash function would tell you basically where the head of the list was, and then you'd have to again traverse the list to actually look for the exact object, right? So again, so the, the idea is that you uh, you want to avoid a hash function should, be, should basically be good enough to avoid clustering in that way so that you know, you you still get near constant time retrievals from the hash function, from the from the hash table. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so so here are a few exam obviously some examples of of uh, implementations of of hash functions. Java has hash table hash map. I I remember looking that up every time I do Java. Like, what's the difference between hash table and hash map? And I think it has to do something with it being one of them is synchronous and one of them is not. But that's that's I think one of them is thread safe. I think <laughs> Python has a dictionary, Ruby has a hash object, and the other, and the thing that I learned least recently figured learned was the map object in JavaScript, right? So JavaScript, I mean in ES six they added a map object which is basically a hash table. Uh, who 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 else has been using the ob the JavaScript object just as a hash table just? <laughs> Everybody, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so now I guess now we have another option, right? So the idea is that if you, I mean, if you are working on a fairly modern application that 
supports you know where you are guaranteed that all your browsers are going to support map you can use the map project uh, as you can see there are a few examples of how that works uh, it follows a very simple syntax that most you know map has tables do uh, and, the, and the and the cool thing about the javascript map object is that uh, it has the additional advantage of actually having uh, uh, it maintains the order so so that's guaranteed with the, with the javascript map object so the order in which you add the elements to the map is the same order in which you'll retrieve it. So if you're going to iterate through something like a JavaScript map, you know, you, it'll always be the same order. I think I don't think the object doesn't work like that. Yeah. All right. Let's see. All right. So so the so the next. So once since we, we've covered hash tables, died, the next thing that I wanted to talk about was text. A set is, is, is basically an unordered collection of elements, and the, the point of sets is that there are never any duplicates on the set, right? So the idea is that uh, it, you have a collection of, of values or of objects, and they're, they're guaranteed to be unique. If you try to add the uh, object to the to the set that already exists, it's, it's basically going to just either overwrite it or you know it just it's going to be the same. It's not going to add it to the set. It's not going to like if you add the same object to the list, it's going to add add it twice, but if you add the same object to the list, to a set twice, it's, that's not going to work. You're, gonna, you're just going to have one object in the set. Uh, Java, set. There are implementations of a set in, in, in most languages. Even JavaScript has an implementation of, of, of the set object, I think at least in ES6. With, 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 set, with sets, uh, what's cool about sets is that you can do operations on sets. So whenever you want to like compare a, two collections, uh, like which we have to do all the time, right? Do you have a list of things and then you have another list of things and then you want to say what's in list A that's not in list B and so on. So you can do, or you can combine the two lists into a single list without any duplicates. Uh, so you, set operations are are supported usually, if a, if a language supports sets, they would also support set operations. Uh, the common set operations that I've listed are union, which is a combination, intersection is figuring out what is common among the two sets? Uh, the difference is differences is, is is interesting because it depends on what what the first and the second collection is, right? So if you if in this example, for example, A minus B is whatever elements that are in A that are not in B, and and the other and B minus A is the other way around. So whatever elements that are in B that are not in A, right? And symmetric difference is basically an L is 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 a, is a union of the two differences, right? So the idea is that what what are the elements among the two sets that are that are only in one or the other that are not in both, right? So that's and that's basically a, a union of the two differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another way to think about set operations is SQL joins. Uh, as you can see, uh, a few examples right in the middle. Over here, that's the, the intersection operation is the same as the inner join. Uh, a full outer join at the bottom left is basically a union, right? Uh, and then on the bottom right, there is the full outer join where both the, you know, where at least one of the two keys is null, which means uh, you, you have, you're excluding stuff that isn't both, so that, that's what you're getting on the, at the what you end up is is with the symmetric difference over here. All right. Mm -hmm. So another few examples about about uh, about these kind of data structures. Uh, so as I was saying, like previously, like the order of in in sets and and in uh, and in hashes, usually the order is not maintain but then there are some languages that give you this feature like they give you data structures that also have this added advantage of maintaining the order right so in python there is i think in python 2 they, in, there was an order dict collection object but in python 3 now the dict object is in itself like guaranteed to maintain order so there's no need for a, a special collection for that and the same thing as as an ordered set this is something that we actually ran into recently when i was working on something like there was a there was a unit test that was failing in one of, in our code where it turned out that one of the things, one of the 
collections in the in the in the in that we were using was a set, and because there were two things in the set, the unit test assumed that the first thing would would be the one that would be returned. Would you know what? That was basically there was an operation that took out the first things on the set and it did a comparison and but because it was a set you know it was it's not guaranteed so it was like running in some places not running in some places and we were like trying to figure out and then finally we figured out that it was actually because it was a set so what i did was uh, i found this ordered set data type uh, it's it's basically a recipe of the python collections page and you you once i created that and it, it basically implemented using a linked list and a dictionary as you might imagine, uh, and then once you did, once you did that, you know that kind of fixed the test. So that was fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So so now that we've been talking a bunch about data structures, I wanted to kind of take a uh, take some time to talk about algorithms, uh, and we'll get back to some of the data structures later, right? So what we talked about is mostly like just collections, like lists and uh, and and uh, sets and hashes, but we'll get, get into non-linear structures later. Uh, so what are, the, what are alg algorithms are, are instructions to use a to perform a task, right? Uh, some of the ways that we measure al algorithms are time complexity and space complexity, right? Time complexity is basically how many op operation it takes for the algorithm to run, and that's basically a function of the size of the input. So the idea is that based on how big your input is, how long is you know the algorithm or the, the function going to take? Uh, space complex complexity is is similar. It's about as your size of your input grows, how much working storage that do you need to be able to uh, to to perform that you know to, to complete that algorithm or to perform that function? Uh, okay. So for, for time complexity, what we what generally use is the big O notation. The big O notation is basically used to classify algorithms by their first, by their worst running time, right? The idea is that it provides, it gives you a sense of how uh, the the time that that you need for the algorithm to run will grow as your as your input is growing. And one of the ways that the big O notation is uh, is calculated is using asymptotic analysis, which is basically Evaluating functions as their values approximate, as they basically grow larger, right? As their values grow larger, to see how how the functions are, how the function value changes. So to give an example of what that is, is that now now here we have a function that gets the minimum of from a list, right? So as we can see on line six and six, seven, and fourteen, there are like three operations that happen one time, and then between nine, between lines nine and 12, we have a loop, right? So for each element in the array, we basically run that loop, right? So the idea is that, as you can see on the, on the right, for size one, the number of operations will be two times one plus three, and then so on. Uh, and finally, like, so the function to calculate the number of operations, which is which is called Fn, is two n plus three. So we, we so we can say this function is of the for in, in terms of big O, it's on, it's of the order n, right? So that's that's how big the big O notation is called, is is useful in kind of giving you a sense of how long a function will take. This is an example of a linear function, obviously. Similarly, if you had something that where f n turned out to be f n square plus five n plus five, we would say the it's of the order n square. That would be a quadratic time, right? So the idea is that. Uh, that's how that's how much that's how quickly the time take that you take for a function to run will grow as your as the size of the input grows. Mm -hmm. So this is a chart that basically gives a sense of what's good and bad in terms of time complexity when we are thinking about algorithms. Uh, as you can see, uh, O of one is constant time. That's like a retrieval of an element from a hash or re retrieving an element from a set. That's almost like constant time. Log of n is 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 something that we will we'll get to soon enough, but that's basically logarithmic time, where basically the number of operations reduces by half for each run. That, that so the so the size of your of your samples of the space that you're trying to find the solution in reduces by half 
in each after every iteration. O of n is linear time that is basically retrieving stuff from a list, uh, adding stuff to a linked list, or adding uh, things like that. N log n is interesting because that's a combination of linear and logarithmic time. Uh, we'll see an example of that as well. And then as you can see later, there is uh, quadratic time, exponential time, and factorial time, which is uh, to give you a sense of how bad these can be is there's a table that I, that I found. As you can see, uh, as, as the size of the input grows, you know, it very quickly you can see how, how long, if you have like quadratic time, you, you'll run into something that will take, so takes a long time very soon, right? If it's exponential time, you know, which is, which is the last row here, last column here, you're, you're doomed as soon as you hit like a hundred elements. But, uh, but in terms of uh, log logarithmic time is still good, even if you like, you know, if your input is a one, it's a million, right? So, and of course, this is, has a caveat. This is a, it's a very slow CPU, and it's, you know, it's taking, it, it basically that's, it's, it's just indicative of how long things can take and how uh, badly, you know, the time that it that take that it takes to run something can grow. Based, if you're not, you know, if you're not uh, aware of how of of the uh, the complexity of the function that you're trying to run, right? Yeah. All right. So, so what, uh, so the next thing that that we'll talk about a little bit was sorting algorithms. That's usually like the most the easiest way to uh, uh, to demonstrate like big like you know, the, the complexity of a function, right? So the things that we'll uh, we'll review when we review a few sorting algorithms are the time the time complexity, the space complexity. The space complexity is interesting because every sorting algorithm needs some sort of working storage, right? So so what so just to kind of simplify that, we will just talk about whether the, the sorting can happen in place or does it need space outside of the array and swap space to actually run, right? So whether it's whether it's in place or out of place. And the, and the stability. Stability is, an, again, an interesting metric for a sorting algorithm because that, it basically tells us if given a list of elements, if there are two elements that are same, where if, if the order in which, the, if the original order will be maintained for, for that uh, in, the, in the result, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing, obviously, is the, the simplest thing, the bubble sort. <coughs> So this is again just an example of one iteration of a bubble sort, where you have an array. The idea is that after each iteration, you have, you'll have, the most, the highest number will be the last element of the array, and then now you have to do the the next iteration to you know to to the rest of the array, right? So if you look at look at this, we are basically comparing the array, and then, and as if you, since we're basically moving all the stuff to the end of the array. Uh, we'll be basically moving the larger element to the end of the array. After first iteration, the number nine is basically at the end. And now you have to continue iterating. One way to kind of speed up a bubble sort is that in any iteration, if you don't have any swaps, it, it means that the sorting is, means the array is probably sorted, right? But even with that, in terms of big O notation, you know, this sorting by a bubble sort takes quadratic time. So it's the all. The time complexity for this is O of n square. Uh, it is, it, it's an in-place sorting algorithm, obviously, because we're not using any extra space other than the swap space that is needed to swap the two elements. And uh, it is, it is stable because if there are two elements that were in the same order, they will, they will, they will be in the same order in the result as well, right? So, so that way it is a stable algorithm. Mm -hmm. So next algorithm that, that uh, that I was using to kind of demonstrate uh, time complexity was the merge sort. The merge sort is, is again, it's a pretty simple algorithm. The idea is that you basically have a list, you keep dividing that list into smaller lists till you have like a single element. And then once you have a single element, you basically merge, merge them into smaller sorted lists. And then once you have Smaller sorted list, you keep merging them into larger sorted lists until your whole list is sorted, right? So here, as you can see, on the left is basically the divide operation, where you have a list of eight elements. We keep dividing them into single elements. 
And now, now that we have single elements, we just keep merging them into, into uh, you know, smaller lists. So on, and, and on, on, on the second line on the right, we have all the lists of size two that are sorted. And then on the next line after that, there are lists of size four that are sorted amongst themselves. And then finally, in the last operation, you have the whole list that is sorted, right? Mm -hmm. Merge sort is, is an example of, of an algorithm that takes n log n operations. The reason, the way we get here, I mean, I mean, there is, the way we get here is that, is that as you can see, there are eight uh, append operations at every, at every step. And then you have basically the number of iterations that are needed are, are log of n, which is because we're dividing the, because we're dividing the whole list into half each time, or we're combining the list from half into into double each time. Uh, that's it's it's basically an example of of uh, of an algorithm that takes n log n operations. This is called linear thymic or quasi linear. It's almost linear. Uh, the other thing about the about merge sort is that it is uh, it is stable. But it, it does require extra space, right? So it, it, it's an out of space sorting algorithm. It, it needs space out, uh, because we're using space that is not, that is outside of the swap space. It's, you know, it needs some extra space. It's called an out of place sorting algorithm or external sorting algorithm. All right. I need to take some a break before I get into quick search. Rashad, did you make all these drugs? Mm -hmm. No. I, I, go, I, I got them from, I, I'll refer that to the end, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, 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 I just, I, it's, it's basically, a, it's, it's a series on, on Medium, I think there was from somebody, oh. yeah. It's really nicely done. So I, I use that as a jumping point for a lot of, a lot of this presentation. Mm -hmm. All right, so the last, so the, the thing, the, the quick sort, this is, I'm, I'm gonna take a deep breath because this is always challenging to explain. It's one of the more challenging. I, I still get kind of confused sometimes when I try to explain this, so I'm going to do it slowly. Uh, I think I'm doing pretty well on time. Anyway. Uh, so with quick sort, the way this it works is that when you have a list, you choose a pivot point, and then based on the pivot point, you partition the list into two smaller lists. Uh, the idea is that one list will be will have values that are less than the pivot value. The other list will have values that are more than the pivot value, right? And then now that you have it. The list is sort, sorted relative to the pivot point. Next, the next thing is basically you take the two smaller lists and then you just apply the same procedure to that each time, right? So, and then, and you keep doing that till the whole list is sorted. Uh, so with quick sort, the, the meat of the operation is the partition operation, right? So that's something that I just wanted to indicate uh, here. So as you can see over here, we have a list of six elements. We, you can choose the pivot, the, one of the things about quick sort is that it, it basically, it depends, it really depends on, the pivot is, it could be arbitrary. The idea is that it, you could, you choose the first element, the last element. The performance of the quick sort is best if you choose something that is basically somewhat in the middle in terms of the value of, you know, the range of the values. But obviously because the list is unsorted, you really don't know, right? So here what we're doing is we are basically choosing something that is, a value that is somewhat in the middle to start as the pivot, and that and then that's basically our starting point, right? So now, to start, there are two pointers. There's one pointer to the to the left, and then another pointer to the right, which is the first and the last element in the array. And then you keep moving the left pointer till it is till you find a value that is higher than the pivot point, and then you keep moving the right pointer till you find a value that is smaller than the pivot point, and that we get to that at Step five over here, as you can see, the left and right pointers are now, and now you now that you you found those two values, you basically swap them, right? So you, the idea is that you swap the values at the left and the right pointers, and then you keep doing that, right? Uh, and then what happens is at some point the left and the right pointers will basically cross each other, and that's the point where you have to stop, right? So the idea is that once once the left and the right pointers have passed each other, your partition operation is done, and now as you can see. Relative to five, all the values before five are less than five, and all the values after five are more than five, right? So, so that's basically the pivot of the partition operation. And then the idea is that you would now op apply the same algorithm to the first half of the array, the first three elements, and then the next, the last two elements, right? And you keep doing that 
till you basically get to a part point where everything is sorted. Yeah. In a perfect world, your median value yeah. would be also start off right in the middle right. of, the, of the list. Right. Yeah. Let me see if I have some notes. Right. Uh, there's a lot of analysis that happens on Pixar. Obviously, like I mean, uh, one of the fun, the funny things about Pixar is that if your list is almost sorted, it gives you a really bad performance. It almost approaches quadratic time, like n square. Uh, the other thing about Pixar, I think there are a lot of different strategies in terms of choosing the pivot point that basically affect the running time of the of, of Pixar. Uh, and finally, what else? At one point, and also like there's there's something called parallel quick sort because you're using recursion. You know, once you partition in the array, you can now sort the smaller parts in parallel, right? So that can also help speed up the sort operation. Yeah. Based on the value, yeah. But I mean, as I said, we you, we don't really know, right? And that's the whole point. Right? <laughs> Yeah, but if you know the range, for example, then you can choose a pivot point. That is, if you know it, so that's that, that. Those are just things that you can use to speed speed it up, right? Yeah. So finally, so so just kind of in summarizing the three sorts that we saw: uh, bubble sort has quadratic time; it's in place and it's stable. Merge sort is n log n; it's out of place and it is stable. Quick sort is uh, again n log n. Most of the time, in some cases, it approaches n quadratic time, which is really bad. Uh, it's, but it, but it has the advantage of being in place, but also it's not stable, right? So you, if you have values that are similar in the in the in the in the list, they might be swapped in the in the sort list, right? Uh, so the, the interesting, I was looking up where these sorts are used, obviously. So one of the things that was interesting is that the JavaScript implementation itself, it uses insertions. It uses insertion sort, which is similar to bubble sort, which is runs in quadratic time for elements for arrays that are 10 or less. And anything more than that, I think, is it uses quick sort. Uh, I think Safari uses uh, merge sort because for, for its sorting algorithm, because it, I think the reason that maybe it may be because it's stable, right? Because it's not using. Uh, even though it needs more space, it you know it, it it is a stable algorithm, and in no I think so. I think I misspoke. In, the JavaScript engine uses uses uh, insertion sort for up to twenty three elements, and then it uses quick sort after that. So I I'm, I was uh, that was funny because like how did they come up with something like I, I guess they must have done a lot of tests and benchmarks to come up with a number like twenty three to be like the limit for insertion sort versus then moving to something like quick sort. Right? Right. So that's all I had so far about algorithms, about at least algorithms and linear data structures. The next thing I wanted to talk about was some other non-linear data structures. So the first thing is, is something like trees. Obviously, trees are, 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 are very uh, popular. Just in terms of nomenclature, you can see there is a root node. There are edges which basically connect the the, the node to the next nodes. A child node is is all, always relative to the to the root node. Uh, an internal node is anything that is not that has some children, at least one or more children. And a leaf node is 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 are the nodes at the end which have no 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 child nodes, right? Mm -hmm. So trees are obviously like very found some of the examples of, of trees are like the document object model for example as you can if you think about html the, the way the dom is created that's basically a tree a directory structure for you know a folder structure on on, on disks that's also an example of a tree where you have basically directories nested under each other and then the files in, in the directory could be leaves right that that's an example of a tree Mm -hmm. Binary trees are are a very specific type of tree. Uh, with binary trees, you have a, a node can have at most two children, and it's it's also like the idea is that it's kind of a recursive data structure. Where I mean, trees are generally recursive data structures too, but with with binary trees, each 
subtree is also a binary tree, right? So I think that's that's how that works. Uh, binary trees. Uh, one of the applications of binary trees is is binary search, right? Now, for example, this is an example of a binary search. The binary search is 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 a way of of searching for element in an array that is sorted, as as you know, as I'm, I'm sure most of us are aware. So the idea is that if you, if an array is sorted and you're looking for something in the array, you can use binary search to find it. And the way you do that is basically you you take the the length of the array, you you find the middle element, and then you compare that with the value that you're looking for. And based on whether it's more or less than the value that you're looking for, you're then limiting your search to that half of the array. And then you keep doing that till you till you find it, right? So in this case, we have uh, a binary search where we're looking for element 12, which is ironically the first element, so you would probably find it faster with linear search, but uh, but you keep basically dividing it into half to you actually run into it, right? So the, another way of looking at the same binary search is if you had something, if you had the same array represented as something called a binary search tree, right? So the, this is exactly the same array, but the idea is that the binary search tree, we have uh, values that are arranged in a way where, where the where the where the left where the left children of each node are have are less than the than the root, and the right children are more than the root. So when you when you look again when you're looking for the value 12, you would basically do the same thing here, right? You would start at 26. You would say, oh, because it's less than 26, then you'd go to the left child of 26, which is 19. And then you'd go to the left child of 19, and then you'd run into 12, right? So, so that's basically how binary search could work in uh, as as a tree, right? Uh, the the point of this is that obviously it would be nice if arrays would always be sorted, but but as we as we discussed, sorting is in itself an expensive operation, so which is why trees are useful, right? Because there are many techniques and basically that help you maintain a structure that is where you can basically find something quickly in logarithmic time if you arrange some in a tree, right? I mean, I don't really have any details about that in this presentation, but but I, I did read up on that a little bit. Uh, what happens, what you have to do is basically try to keep it balanced as much as you can. Uh, a balanced tree is basically where the left and the right parts of the tree are more or less the same size, or they don't differ by more than one. And if, for example, if you're inserting stuff in the tree and you were inserting smaller numbers a lot, you basically end up with a situation where the left side of the tree has many more elements compared to the right side of the tree. And then at some point, what you're going to do is rotate it so that you basically basically have a new root and then you kind of balance the number of elements on the right and the, and the left. That basically helps you keep, maintain the logarithmic search time for any new elements as you try to find them. So the last thing, last few uh, data structure and algorithm is basically related to graphs. So what are graphs, right? So uh, it's kind of inverted, right? So graphs are more general purpose. A tree is a kind of a subset of a graph where uh, a tree basically, like it has the same structure where there are, there are nodes and there are edges, but in, 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 a, in a tree, you cannot have any kind of a circular relationship between you cannot there are no circular paths through a tree right everything is basically top down in graphs you know you might be able to basically go start with an element and then as you go through the graph you might be able to come back to the same element right so that's the difference between a, a tree and a graph uh, and the other thing about graphs is that is that again the edges they, they can they can be weighted in some cases, like for example, they may have a value. If you think about a graph, like if this this graph represented, for example, the distance between two cities, the the, the weight of the edge, you know, would have the, the 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 number in miles, for example. And the other the other thing about the edges between the graphs is that they could also be directional, right? For example, in this 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 example of a graph is 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 a non-directional graph where basically something like distance, but if you were thinking about time, 
Like for example, the time it takes to drive from place to place, and then all the places were nodes of a graph. That would be mostly be a directed graph because then it would depend on the traffic in each direction, right? So the time it takes to go from, for example, here to DC versus the time it takes to come back from DC to here, it, it depends on the time of the day. So you cannot, it would, it you would represent that as a as a, as a directed graph, right? Uh, so the so the last algorithm that we'll talk about is Jigsaw's algorithm. That's this is one of my favorite algorithms. It's basically a way of you st okay, within a graph. The idea is that you want to basically find the shortest path to all the other nodes in that graph, right? Uh, or at least, or, or starting from a starting point, you want to then find the shortest path to that graph, uh, to a different node in that in the same graph. So the way this proceeds is 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 this way. Uh, the idea is that you what you do is you you have a starting point, so that gets the value zero. Everything else is marked as being infinitely away from that point, right? And then what you do is, you, from the starting point, you visit all the, the, the neighboring nodes, and based on the weight of, of the edges that, that you traverse to get to the node, they get a value. And, and, and then the, you, you, you pick up the node which basically has the least value after the first visited node, and then you basically keep doing the same thing over and over again, right? So, I mean, it's hard to kind of explain it in text, so I thought we would just go through it step by step in pictures. <laughs> so here we are, we are, we are we're basically starting with A, with the node A, and then we, we're finding the shortest path to all the rest of the vertices in, in the graph, right? So we have the visited array is currently empty. The unvisited array has everything in it, but because A has a value of zero, we start with that, right? The next one is from A, you can get to C and B. So the value, the C gets the value three and B gets the value seven. And then you also store the previous, the vertex that you came from. So now you have a record of basically the shortest path to B and C based on where you are coming from, right? So you're, since you're coming from A. And now the next thing, now that you, you visited all the neighbors of A, the, the, the next vertex that you want to visit is basically which has the smallest value. So you can see here, C has the smallest value of three, so that's what we're gonna visit next. So once you visited C, you can see that you can now get to B with the quicker than if you go directly through A, right? Because A through B is seven, but if you go via C, you can get there, we can get there with the value four. It basically it has a shorter shorter path. Even though you're you're taking more hops, you you get there faster. Uh, and then so you replace replace that with four and, and with the previous vertex is updated to C and then and so on. And then with C you visit all the other vertices vertices that are possible that are, that have not yet been visited. So now that's basically D, which is and the value for that is whatever the value for C was plus the the edge value for C D, which is two. That's five. And then basically you keep doing this till you visited all the vertices. And I think this is a couple of steps ahead. And now here you have, you know, the shortest path for from A through through the rest of the graph, right? So that's every that's all the all the vertices in the graph. Right? That's it. All right. So that's basically all, all I had so far about about data structures and algorithms. What I wanted to talk about a little bit about, about is I read this article while I was coming up with this presentation. It's, uh, it's from DHH. It was called Contextual Compression. I think the idea was that the article that I read was kind of celebrating the fact that now we, we this is like almost like the golden age of programming, right? We have, we basically, you can start programming applications without, with knowing very little about actual nuts and bolts about what needs to know, what goes on in the back end and so on. Like for example, a web application developer, you don't really, for somebody who is starting out doing web application, you don't really need to understand how a database works. You just, you know, you can, the ORMs have, are sophisticated enough that app, that basically abstract away all that stuff for you. I mean, of course, as you, as you, as you do more with your, with your application or application grows, you need to understand a little bit about how the ORM is using the database, but 
obviously it's not a barrier to start with right uh, a lot of the complexity that we that we would or maybe i don't know arthur and joel used to deal with with memory management and so on <laughs> they have not that kind of uh, they mostly been abstracted away right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that that's the, the idea is that is that basically like the, what what we what we have to come up with is figure out is that where where is the where where do we find the balance right about not not caring for or not understanding how things work versus like you know at some point you have to kind of get get down you know to maybe you have to write a sql query for something that is really difficult to get to the database but as i think we were talking to wes yesterday about was it a couple of days ago we were talking about how it, like if you're using a framework you're probably better off you know trusting the framework till it proves otherwise so, so i think that's basically the 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 push and pull of you know of of the current the way programming or web web application development works these days i mean as as i was as i was talking about or um, i think that this is usually i think it's surprising to me but i think this still seems to be a sticking point in, in a lot of teams i mean I, i know that i mean we use orm a lot but it's not something that uh, some some sometimes there are we, we get you know teams where basically nobody wants to trust the orm and you want to write you know sql for every even a simple get like, operation right but at the same time we have to be careful right because i mean i think my one of the things about about this is that it's it's uh i'm always worried whenever we use orm the first thing i worry about is like the n plus 1 curse right like the most the simplest thing that we do usually is is retrieving a bunch of data filling up a table and then you have something in the table that comes from some other related object and you want to make sure that you don't end up calling you know the database 100 times if there are 100 rows in the table or doing a computation 100 times and so on right even though it's linear as you said linear is not bad but if you're going to hit database you know 100 times to just fill up a table of 100 rows that's probably not the best way to do it right uh but at the same time uh, like because we're operating at a level that we don't have to worry about memory management we don't have to worry about allocating spaces to arrays you know the i remember when we started when i started doing java the array list object i was so happy i just converted all my arrays to array list and they'd not worry about index out of bounds forever <laughs> forever right so so i think that so that does allow us to be creative right i mean we are, we are able to solve problems in a way that is that is that is useful for for ourselves for our clients have fun while doing while doing uh, programming with not worrying about you know low level details about things right so yeah so that so i think so that was i mean i i was talking about this because it, i mean that's what it reminded me of based on you know what i was talking about previously like you know we have all these data structures we there are all tools in our toolbox the idea is to pick to kind of add to the toolbox that you that you have available to you at any given point but it maybe not get caught up right like for example i mean i don't i don't think i've written a sort in anything that i've done recently right and usually you just throw it to you just call the sort method of whichever language you're using or whichever framework you're using and you trust that the the framework is doing it the right way right so you you might have to if you're sorting objects you might have to like provide the comparison function that you that they did they, they use but other than that i mean we don't really worry about these things right but but sometimes it's just like in our my case it was just fun to kind of step back and just review all these things for myself <laughs> So I don't really have any big conclusions. <laughs> so like, do whatever works for you. But you know, and, and these are the references that I use. The uh, so so the first link is basically the base CS series. In uh, I basically found this some time ago, and I I was reviewing it often while coming up with with the concepts. A lot of the figures that I used are from there. It's basically kind of talks through a bunch of data structures, a lot of different algorithms, even stuff. like red black trees and b trees you know database indexing and stuff like that uh there was i found this article by somebody who was very passionate about linked list so that i think that person was like like why doesn't ruby have a linked list so they they wrote like a whole huge article about that and then the rest of the stuff is just other things that i kind of reviewed while looking at you know looking up material for for this for this presentation uh and that's it 
That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>